Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Specifying Practice Group webinar. Our topic for today is Future Specifications, Specification Automation and Interoperability. Our thought leaders today are David Sussman and Louis Megpass. Dave is a registered architect, certified construction specifier, and founding principal of Conspectus, Specifications Quality Assurance Consulting Firm. Lewis is an architect and certified construction specifier. Lewis is a senior quality manager for Gresham Smith & Partners, a national architectural, engineering, and interiors, and planning firm. A few housekeeping notes quickly before we begin. Your participation during today's webinar is encouraged, and we've allowed time to take questions throughout the presentation. And although attendee audio lines are muted, you may click the raise hand button to indicate that you have a question or comment. We'll identify you by name and unmute your line, at which point you may begin to speak. If you're participating via streaming audio and do not have a computer microphone, you may also type your question in the chat box. Now, David Lewis, over to you. Hello to everyone. Glad to be back with you. And we're looking forward to a new year of opportunities and learning new tips and tricks on how to do better specifications and improve our, our work performance. And uh, we, uh, this past year was really a lot of fun for me. And I learned a lot preparing for the sessions. And I learned a lot from the ideas and concepts that our uh, noble audience uh, provided. And so we're looking, I'm looking forward to uh, learning some new things this year myself, as well as maybe uh, helping encourage some other folks. So uh, let's settle back and. Uh, Keep those cards and letters coming in with ideas for programs. Uh, you know, David and I have uh, limited imaginations. Uh, we've got some um, ideas for, uh, we've got next month already planned, and we've got some ideas for the future. But if there are things that you need us to deal with uh, and would be of interest, general interest, please let us know. And uh, this is your program, uh, not ours. And we want to make sure that you're getting what you want. Great. Thanks, Lewis. And I think what I'll do is I'll try to introduce Leon. And Leon, I'm a bit of a disadvantage because I don't have my notes with me on the road, unfortunately. But uh, today we have a guest presenter with us. It's Leon Gorbati. Uh, he's one of the principals of Teak. I wanted to let you know I'm Advanced Research Foundation uh, where Leon began working on a specification automation system, and I was helping to contribute uh, by uh, attending weekly meetings and, and commenting on the progress and such. And I thought it would be something that you might be interested in seeing as an alternative to word processing and even an alternative to database, uh, because the system that Leon is developing is all XML-based. Uh, with that, I think what I'll do is uh, go ahead and let him show us what he has developed. And just to let you know, too, I, uh, Leon just told me that they announced the first release of their software December 29th. So it is now available to the public. So, Leon, wel uh, welcome. I'm glad you're able to join us and demonstrate what you have today. Okay. Thank you very much, David. And I'll uh, also get, uh, start out with an introduction. Um, on a technical note, I'm on uh, headphones and microphone in case there's any audio problem. I've got microphone on standby. So if I disappear, somebody please punch a message into the chat box and I will call back in um, on the telephone. Uh, can everybody see my screen? I think so, Glenn. Go ahead. Okay. I've got it. should have a uh, PowerPoint up right now. So um, a little bit of history on the presenter and the engineering essentials company. Um, I founded the company in Texas in 2009. Uh, my personal background, I was uh, formally educated as a mechanical engineer, um, specializing in compressors and steam turbines and pumps, primarily for oil and gas applications. And uh, somewhere along the way there, I hit my head on an I-beam and uh, decided to go on vacation and become a software developer. So I uh, spent uh, about five years uh, working for uh, Bentley Systems in Exton, Pennsylvania as a software developer, and then returned to the engineering industry as an engineering contractor. And um, I was also uh, 
participating as uh, my company's uh, technologists, uh, te technologist in the FIATEC consortium and other similar initiatives. And in an attempt to sort of keep my fingertips dirty and not forget how to program, I started automating some of my more repetitive and tedious tasks as an EPC contractor. And a lot of it had to do with specifications. Um, so I basically started converting engineering specifications into XML for the purpose of connecting them to other business workflows, such as the procurement process, um, generating bid tabulations and comparisons to align various suppliers to make sure that they're compliant to specifications, and also enabling inspectors and quality assurance personnel to be able to better get back to the pertinent specifications. And initially, um, this basically started as a self-use tool and a prototype and applied it for uh, on actual projects uh, for multiple clients, such as British Petroleum, ConocoPhillips, uh, and uh, several others. And a lot of customers started saying, you know, you really got something there. Uh, you should uh, try to make a product out of it. And that's how the idea was born. And it was really um, uh, nurtured and wetted in a uh, interoperability consortium called FIATEC, where it, uh, various other organizations said that you know there's some value to what you're doing and uh, this whole entire vision really was um, born and built on open standards and interoperability so I'm going to uh, I've got a, a PowerPoint presentation where I'm going to talk about the concepts the challenges uh, some of it uh, you as, as specifiers you're probably intimately familiar with um, and then at the end I'm going to do a little bit of a product demonstration and um, open it up for questions Everything okay with audio and video so far? So far, so good, yeah. Leon. Okay. So the current situation in industry is that technical specifications form the basis for most buildings, plants, and engineered equipment. Creating, maintaining, distributing, and implementing specifications is frequently a very large component of engineering projects. And following the specification requirements throughout the entire asset life cycle is often a manual task at best and a possible task at worst. The challenges are specs are cumbersome. There's a lot of volume. Uh, there's a lot of maintenance, revisions, references inside the specifications to other specifications to industry standards. And typically, the, pres the preferences and the deviations are the most important paragraphs, but are, they kind of get dropped to the crack because they're outside of business as usual. Some specifications families have grown vast and historically complex and have become a, essentially a tangled web of cross-reference and frequently conflicting information that takes a lot of engineering time to get resolved and cleared up on, on every table. So the lay of the land are many lineages or families of technical specifications. There's the widely recognized industry standards. Uh, there's the CSI formatted master guide architecture and construction specifications. I have become introduced to CSI formatted specifications uh, pretty well. Like I said, my background is really in oil and gas. And my impression is that CSI is well ahead of other industries and uh, the architectural and construction industry, therefore, in terms of having a standardized format and a, uh, a consistent approach to specifications, um, which uh, quickly led a lot of our efforts to get involved in this arena. Um, so there's uh, no surprise there. But there's also the corporate standards uh, for the large refiners and large power companies. And a lot of those have come together for mergers and acquisitions. And uh, there's a lot of volume there. Um, and then we get into discipline-specific specs and site or geographic-specific specs and so, and so on. Are all those specs really different? Well, practically all specs follow a numbered hierarchical paragraph format. There is similar language and declarations of requirements among all the engineering disciplines, and therefore a common data model and a generalized interoperability scheme for these all-important documents is paramount. So how do we propose to automate specs? The core concept is that specs become XML documents, spec paragraphs become XML elements, therefore specs become electronically extractable and programmatically accessible, therefore engineering requirements become computational data. The implications and applications are infinite, and I will demonstrate a few of those. Why XML? Well, XML is just about the most prevalent format in technology today. It is still essentially in Rev 1 for the past 15 years. There's been almost nothing in technology that's done that. Uh, it is simple and text-based, 
I'd say relatively simple. There are 1,200 page volumes written on XML technology, but at its basic core and its basic application, it is actually very simple. Uh, and all that leads to content stability, versioning, and reuse. So um, open standards, it, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Open Packaging Convention, the OPC. It is actually an ISO standard that was proposed to industry by Microsoft. Um, it is actually the file format for today's Office documents, starting with Microsoft Office 2007 and further, uh, the DOCX file format, uh, the, the Excel X file format. Um, those are all open packaging, OPC files. Um, it's basically a technology f that optimizes compression, XML, and binary object in a reusable package. We are introducing the SpecX file format, which stands for engineering specifications, and the LibEx file format, which stands for packages and libraries of engineering specifications. And it's open, it's, it's open XML, and that leads to interoperability and integration just in itself. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, this whole initiative was really born out of collaboration through technology consortia and uh, listed kind of a, a, a mosaic of some of the companies that uh, have been working with us, um, also some of the consortia that have been working with us. And um, we actually operate a, uh, an active project in FIATEC that's called Specification Automation. Um, if you're not familiar with FIATEC, I'd like to encourage you to uh, check out the website, check out uh, our project, uh, the next technology uh, conference is in Miami in April. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, if you're not familiar with this uh, conference, I have to say I go to a lot of technology conferences. This is by far my favorite one in terms of the caliber of the people that go there, the education, and uh, so I highly highly recommend it. Um, and through there, we are basically collaborating with various groups that are working on the BIM standard, the ISO 16739 standard, uh, the ISO 5926 standard. Um, if you're not familiar with it, that's uh, similar to BIM, but focused more on uh, plant and uh, other industries. And um, we are also working with PIDX, um, Process Industry Data Exchange, and we have an, an active project going on with Carnegie Mellon University. Um, civil engineering department, which I will actually mention a little later. So what is the value to industry of all this stuff? Well, capture requirements that are essentially lost in volumes of static documents, execute larger engineering projects with existing manpower at greater accuracy, save money reducing change orders and rework, meet more regulations, and manage specifications across the entire life cycle, reducing the total cost of ownership and reducing the duplication of content. Bottom line is install exactly what you specified as you specified it. And in my experience, that doesn't happen very often. There's also value to standards organizations, such as perhaps uh, CSI and also the APIs and ISOs of the world, because they essentially develop own and maintain the specifications at the highest level in the food, food chain that all of industry feeds from. The standards organizations will benefit themselves with more interoperable engineering specifications, and they will be able to leverage an emerging common industry standard to allow industry to electronically refer, extend, and overlay industry standards, which they typically do, improving the utilization of those standards, improving the ability to uh, handle updates and, and revisions. And um, so we've, uh, all, it's been very important to us to talk to the commercial standards um, authors out there, and that led us to CSRF and uh, a few similar engagements. So the metadata is data about data. About data. Uh, I've been talking about this XML technology. What it does is it lets you represent a, the document text as you would normally see it, but then you have infinite flexibility to add stuff to it for whatever purpose. And these purposes can be really anything that you want, and a common and simple data model allows you to make value of doing anything that, that you want. Um, we're obviously developing some specific applications, uh, but the underlying methodology is really quite flexible. Um, so the SpecX and the LibEx file formats themselves are simply and widely extensible, and therefore they become electronic, and therefore engineering data becomes computational data and the implications and applications are infinite. 
So now, in addition to requirements, you can package entire workflows directly in engineering specifications. And I will be demonstrating that in just a, quick, just a little bit. So specifically, what workflows that benefit? And I find, you know, I, I come from the process industry, but the more I learn about the architecture and construction industry, there's some different terminology, but it seems like a lot of engineering projects really do take the same steps um, and have the same issues in many, in, in many industries. So the first workflow that benefits is obviously just the corporate specification management, or even if you're a small consultancy, your in-house master specification management, um, we're creating the tools to allow you to manage more content, reduce duplication of content, and uh, get better value out of the intellectual property and the know-how that you have in those all-important documents. Um, there are some significant implications to procurement and cost estimating, in fact, and uh, quality assurance and inspection. In fact, that was exactly the areas where I was applying a working prototype, which led to customers say, you know, go make a product out of this. And the things that I was doing is really creating bid tabulations and cost comparisons that were extremely well wetted and and specification compliant in sections of the time in which it was done, it was previously done. And that leads to substantial reductions in cost overruns and change orders and rework. Um, the ability to for inspectors to uh, better ascertain that whatever they're looking at complies with project specifications. Um, we've also added a lot of automation to what the process industry calls subject, subject matter expert approval cycles also known as comments, exceptions, and clarifications. And that is frequently, you know, when you give somebody a package of specifications, it is difficult for them to, especially in a bid phase, it is difficult for them to digest and really um, respond to the cost adders or, or the uh, exceptions that they might take. Frequently, these things come up much later in the project, uh, leading to change orders. And uh, so the ability to actually leverage tags to drive this process has a lot of value. I'll, I'll be demonstrating that as well. Um, and ultimately, the whole XML platform, the stability of the content leads to lessons learned, archiving, handover, a better audit trail. Um, integration and, and uh, concurrency of specifications to CAD and to building information modeling, and uh, all kinds of uh, things become possible. So how exactly do these workflows benefit? Well, first of all, there's a lot of content out there today. We're not suggesting that people begin authoring specifications all over in the SpecX format. So we've actually created a structured migration path that converts con that converts legacy specifications in multiple different formats into a SpecX XML, and you can al already begin to decorate and add quality and value to the content even during the conversion to XML phase. Uh, heavily leveraging custom tags, so you, you basically maximize the flexibility through configuration, and you can define metadata externally or internally in code, and uh, so on. Multi-purpose specifications is one of our key features right now, the ability to reduce duplication of content and create one document that can be decomposed into multiple different purposes, such as uh, you, you know, may, maybe elementary schools versus high schools or, or uh, you know, um, upstream refining versus downstream refining. And uh, we've actually support uh, multiple languages. If you want to write a spec simultaneously in English and Spanish, you can. And I'll be showing some of that uh, stuff, stuff as well. This leads to very powerful tools for spec administrators. We have also created an editing environment that is substantially simplified for people who are not professional editors, professional word processing editors, and maybe professional specification editors, but, but uh, we essentially create an editor that really enforces style and standard so that you cannot, you cannot break it and you cannot corrupt the document. Uh, we have a uh, very advanced search. We have the ability to separate content. Because, and again, leveraging the XML model, the ability to separate content and presentation so that literally hundreds and even thousands of files can be loaded all at once. And that leads to a very advanced search interface, which I will demonstrate, and all the various workflows that are associated with the environment. Um, so I think my, my next few slides are actually elaborate uh, some of those uh, points that I made. So, uh, you know, the custom tags, we provide, a, we provide a simple but yet rich architecture for tagging any paragraph 
or, or fraction of a paragraph um, for any purpose. They essentially become fragments and they automatically get such things as who created it, when it was created. Um, you can set reminders and follow up on every fragment so you can basically take any piece of text that is somehow more important than the text beside it, make an object out of it and uh, do as you wish um, as you wish with it. The tags can be simple or complex. By simple we mean you know it can be an integer, it can be a text string, or it can actually be another object that has tags of its own um, and so on. The possibilities are endless. You can easily make a messy spaghetti out of it, but the reality is that most things that you would typically want to do really require either a simple tag or a very shallow re relationship and uh, therefore uh, tagging and getting a lot of value out of tagging is fairly straightforward. Multipurpose specifications has a very high value, very wide applicability to all kinds of industries. Um, you can consolidate single content to reduce duplication of, the, of effort across divisions, locations, and purposes. Um, and uh, there's also similar value for standards organizations that maintain various sections, chapters, or purposes, or flavors uh, that are otherwise largely similar con content. Again, management optimized for the administrator. There's the migration path. You also get improved data integrity, control, and administration. Um, I mentioned the ability to open many files simultaneously. And uh, you have explicit control over the metadata that drives the workflows of your organization. Editing simplified for project engineers and architects. We have a highly constrained controlled editing environment that enforces standards. For example, if you subscribe to the CSI standard, um, that would be strictly enforced. That prevents individuals from, quote unquote, breaking or corrupting document structure, styling and numbering, and uh, ultimately increases the effectiveness and presentation and consistency of uh, documents by reducing the, degree, the degrees of freedom that an all-purpose editor might have. We have advanced search to replace, be able to find a needle in a haystack. I'll actually demonstrate that uh, shortly. And uh, touching on some of the workflows that are, you know, this whole thing is really based on interoperability and the ability to drive spec related workflows, which, oh, by the way, is most of them, uh, directly off of engineering specifications. So the subject matter expert, the, the master specifier, can actually multitask. Um, while they've got their head on a certain document, a certain section, or a certain paragraph, to also be thinking right then and there about what are the inspection requirements, what are the submittal requirements, what else is this paragraph saying that's important, and being able to mark it right there on the paragraph without generating standalone lists or appendices and so on. We can generate standalone lists and appendices then by scraping that metadata off of the engineering object objects. Um, and that will reduce tedious, the tediousness that's frequently associated with creating and maintaining uh, submittal requirements because there's no copy and paste. You don't, you, you don't start another document and reread the specification and start bringing stuff across. You can essentially tag all that stuff directly on the spec while you're writing it. Uh, and there's all kinds of downstream opportunities for leveraging the XML structure, and uh, you, you can deliver uh, handheld information to inspectors, builds of materials, um, run this stuff on the web, and uh, so on. We also have a project underway with Carnegie Mellon University's uh, Civil Engineering Department. Uh, we're working on uh, what uh, uh, they call artificial intelligence. I don't like to use that term because it makes people squirm and run away. So I called it semantic intelligence. But that's really about actually devel developing uh, some verbs and phrases that will um, allow the engineer to snap the content in a specification. That looks like a requirement. Uh, that looks like a declaration. Um, and therefore, making the tagging and multipurposing process uh, much quicker because ultimately it requires a little bit of upfront effort so you can get the downstream benefit of, of the richer specifications. This is yet another technology to actually make that process more efficient and uh, more cost efficient up front. So this is the last slide. The message is automate and interoperate. What, what's more important to interoperate than specifications? They are written for the purpose of communicating requirements to someone or something like a computer. Um, 
there's the opportunity to connect to CAD and BIM, which are very important. And these are the most important documents. Practically everything in engineering stems from them and relates back to them. And it is frequently the case that somebody writes a 200-page spec and gives it to somebody that sits on a desk and never reads it. Um, an environment that allows people to better to better browse, uh, sort, and find things in specifications is uh, very valuable to, it, to industry. At the end of the day, spec information can be paramount to reduce costs, reduce liability, increase reliability, health safety, and increase sustainability. That's the PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to do a little bit of a product demo. I'm not going to get into the underlying XML structure. If you're interested, uh, please follow up with us uh, about that de details, and uh, I'd be happy to uh, follow up with anybody that wants to uh, talk about under the hood. Um, so let me uh, bring up the product. Leon? Yes. Leon? Yes. I'd like to just take a little bit of a pause here and see if there's any questions from any of our group that we might want to try to answer before you dive into the demo. Okay. I don't have any, I don't have any on screen, but uh, here's an opportunity if anybody has a question to put to Leon. Uh, Sheldon is asking if the slides will be available after the presentation. Yes. Okay. Any? I don't see anything else, so feel free to um, go ahead. Okay. So I'm going to. Oh, we, just we actually did have a few come in here, guys. Um, just uh, right now, actually, I uh, see a few. Well, I think um, I timed the PowerPoints for about a half hour, so I'm about four or five minutes ahead. So I'd be happy to take a couple of questions and move on. Okay. Uh, Marilyn was asking, what is the Go ahead, Rob. You want to introduce Miami? Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Yep, I was just saying, can you guys hear me all right, or am I still staticky? It's okay. It's fine. It's, Sorry? it's okay. a little bit, but not a lot. Okay. Uh, Marilyn was asking, what is the conference in April in Miami? That is uh, Fiatech's annual technology showcase. Fiatech typically has uh, two meetings: one in the spring, one in the fall. The spring is a members-only meeting. Uh, the sorry, the fall is a members-only meeting. The spring meeting is is open to the public. Uh, there's an exhibit uh, exhibit hall, and uh, I highly recommend you check it out. To, to look at uh, fiatech.org uh, for further information. Okay. Again, I. I can't really push that conference more. I go, I go to a lot of these, and this one is by far the one I look forward to the most all year long. Great. Okay. Uh, Steve also had a question, and he he had commented that the audio for you, Leon, keeps getting softer and sounds a little staticky. I don't know if that's anything we can improve, but let's let's try if we can. I guess um, I'm not experiencing that on my end. Were you guys hearing that as well? No, it's been fine. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and then Paul had a question. He said, um, "I see some similarities to the government specs intact system. Is this true?" Um, I'm aware of specs intact, and we've talked to uh, NASA and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers about it. But I have to say that uh, my understanding of it is not as deep as I want it to be. I know it's an XML-based system. Um, in that, it's probably similar. But as far as the toolkit and the format, and especially the, um, the the generation and any kind of a technical comparison, I don't have a good handle on myself right now. Okay. And then um, Paul commented, uh, I see some similar, or I'm sorry, that was my chat. Uh, Kent, how can this relate to the use of Reddit? Um, I, I don't have another good answer for that, except that it can be related to all kinds of purposes. I will actually demonstrate um, at least one application, how it relates to something that is completely outside of the specifications. But um, in general, I, I won't necessarily address it from a Revit point of view, but in general, the vision that we have for design interoperability CAD, BIM, whatever it might be, is to 
reduce the copy and paste into the CAD environment that this synchronizes from the specifications. Um, we have also, as far as our software, we have developed libraries to be embeddable in other products. So we're actually talking to Bentley right now, for example, uh, for actually having our environment available directly in uh, MicroStation and Bentley architecture so that people can browse specifications while they're working on engineering design. Um, and I'll, I, I will actually show a quick demo of our context help of how we use the technology to snap along to objects. Uh, we clearly see an environment where uh, while you're working on a design and you're selecting objects and elements in the model that the applicable specification or the entire linkage of relationships could actually snap in real time so that um, the designer or the engineer would always have the latest specifications available to them. Um, none of this stuff is included in our very first product, but it's the kind of things that are going to be very inherent and uh, relatively easily attainable with the kind of technology that we're developing. And I'll, I'll just demonstrate how you can use it for anything. Great, great. And this next one, I'll kind of feel, um, Sharon was asking, can we obtain a link to the recording of this session? And absolutely, anyone who's registered for the group um, will get an email from me shortly after I post the recording, so you all can view it at your leisure there. Uh, and then the final question I see here is from Dennis Elrod. He's, he's asking, uh, do you see this as another player in the game competing with the established programs that are out there? Well, we'd certainly like to. Um, the, one of the things we are very industry agnostic, and uh, the um, it seems like in architecture and construction there is already a market for similar things. We'll certainly like to uh, play along, hopefully in uh, partnerships uh, more so than in direct competition. But uh, we're also talking to customers in the oil and gas industry and the nuclear power industry, where there really isn't anything like this. Um, so it's it, it really kind of depends on industry, and we've actually had nearly a dozen people say, you know, lawyers can really benefit from your stuff and so on, but right now we're focusing on oil and gas and um, architecture and construction uh, where we would certainly like to help you out. Great. Okay, that's about all I had for the questions. Okay, so um, what I actually have loaded up, I've got um, a bunch of different uh, specs loaded in different ways to demonstrate some of the features that I've been talking about. Talking about. Um, so this, for this, for example, is uh, a customer in the uh, in the uh, mining in in the uh, metals and mining in industry. And um, so we just want to demonstrate that you know we've got the ability to handle full graphics, uh, embedded objects, and that all gets handled um, in the OPC package. Uh, you can do the same thing with, with uh, dynamic CAD details and etc. But I also kind of want to focus on some of the uh, workflows that I've mentioned. So if you select uh, any any object uh, in the specification, you can see that there's uh, under the workflows here, there is support for comments, exceptions, and clarifications, for inspection requirements, for material handling, and for vendor information data requirements, also known as submittals in the architect, architect, architectural industry. So you can basically tag an, anything, and then another dialogue comes up, and you can fill in the, the information. And then ultimately, a submittal schedule or any other workflow just becomes a view to the metadata. So you can kind of see this, this document. Um, it has a feedback schedule where the contractor is uh, communicating with the supplier and saying, you know, these are really important paragraphs. I need your comment on it. And you can pick basically any, any object and go into the detail of the feedback requirement. And you can indicate whether it has a cost impact. And you can say whether it's accepted with exceptions, uh, it's accepted with no exceptional clarifications, accepted as noted, uh, added or deduct or rejected, and so and so on. So you so you can drive an automated way of actually getting comments, exceptional clarifications, and you can do the same thing for subject matter approval um, cycles and uh, so and so on. And you can and so when you're looking at any one paragraph, all at the same time, you can be saying, all right, I need. All of these inspections are going to be perf that, that are going to be proven as such and witnessed by so and so. At the same time, you can say that, that 
I need the following drawings or data sheets or inf information. And again, none of these are actual portions of the document. This is just a view to the master document and the tags that have been dropped on the document while the document was, was being developed. Um, this particular customer also requested, and, and, and this and this can really be um, be defined by the administrator. You can declare any tag that you want for any purpose. There are certain ones that we actually support with with the product, uh, but this customer is also interested in uh, multi-purposing uh, multi-purposing language, multi multi-language. So you can mark any particular fragment as English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, or Russian. And uh, then you can develop uh, specs in multiple languages um, or for any document that has multiple purposes. And I'll, I'll show uh, a few more examples of, of that. Uh, one of the features that we also support is uh, material handling, which is kind of going to lead towards the automated bit tabulations, the kind of functionality, which is where this whole idea really kind of kind of came from. So as long if a spec specifies something that is actually a material, uh, you can go to the uh, material to the bill of material schedule, and this will essentially give you all of the various components. Again, these components are not being defined separately. These are, these are essentially being scraped off as statements in requirements. And, uh, but, but then, once this material is received, you can quickly trace back to the specification and the paragraphs that talked about it. And that allows uh, much better handling. You know, I've been in, uh, when I was uh, designing and, and procuring turbo machinery, I've frequently been on a test stand where myself and the inspector are shuffling through 800 pages of uh, sticky note tagged specifications with oily hands and trying to find something that we thought we remembered. Uh, so this, um, you know, this the ability to tag and link leads to the ability to filter and deliver just in time the right content for any milestone in a project. Um, and, and, and further along the life, the, the life cycle, such as decommissioning, uh, spare parts, archiving, and uh, so on. So this is kind of a typical packaged equipment and process spec. Um, what I've got here is uh, CSRF's uh, spec text library. And I have got all 964 files all loaded in one view. You get each, each file is in the tree. And you can just snap to every individual, every individual file and then drill down into any file as, as you need to. And the metadata is actually assignable per object type. So this object here represents the document root, which is the document itself. And you can see that the metadata here is really, this, this is a commercial specification producer. So they tag their documents as far as uh, whether it's an architectural library, a mechanical library, an electrical li library. And um, we also have a um, packaging and library technology, which is not in this release, but it's upcoming. I'll talk about it a little bit more, where you can actually get a dynamic um, a dynamic table of contents, we call it a library matrix, where you can see all of the documents and you have a table of, of, of all of the various metadata of how they're tagged, so you can sort, group, uh, and you can, that way you can quickly select all the documents that belong to a certain section, um, and so on. But uh, everything underneath is the same very repeatable object model that you can, you, you can do anything that you want with. So, what I'm actually going to do with this, uh, so for these 1,000 files, I'm going to invoke the advanced uh, search interface. And uh, this search interface can search for content or metadata. It knows all of the um, unique tag definition schemes are loaded in environment because I have multiple different flavors from multiple different industries loaded in here. It basically allows you to select metadata from them. So basically, you can search for um, any combination of text or text that is marked in some way. So for example, if I search for the word ASTM, and you have to remember I've got um, nearly 1,000 documents loaded in the environment. And if I just search for ASTM, this actually takes about 10 seconds or so, but most of the time is actually rendering the results list. The search itself actually was actually performed in under a second or two, 
and here are 11,208 hits on the Ward ASTM. You can open up any set of, uh, of columns so you can see you know, what file and you, you can sort, so you, you can basically sort this by file name. And the thing is that the search interface is also uh, a dynamic editing interface. You can select any object, it immediately snaps to that object in the, in the um, application itself, but it also gives you the metadata and you can also multi-select. So you, you can select multiple documents and it will automatically calculate the lowest common denominator of the metadata at any hierarchical depth that is applicable to those objects. So for something, um, it will tell you that these objects have different values, but for example, all of these objects just happen to come from the ST library, so, that, so you, and you can bulk edit um, objects and you can basically slice and dice so you can work this kind of a, the thing I mentioned about finding a needle in a haystack. You can find all content and you can find all tags. You, you can find anything that relates to design big build projects and, and so on. So with that I'll show um, um, so here I have another application. There's maybe about 20, 20 files loaded here um, and uh, this customer would would like to have a different nomenclature for their documents that relate to a document management system or an enterprise management sy system and uh, they can be directly linked and exchanged uh, between the SpecX files and the document management system. Um, so, so this is the metadata that goes along with the document level node but if you, if you select an object, and one of the things that we do is uh, I mentioned that we constrain editing and that content becomes engineering objects. You can see, we, we actually show you this. This is, this is bounded and highlighted. These are the extents of the object. This is an entity. It's not just a bunch of lines of text, and they're managed as an entity. Every entity has its own metadata, such as you can make comments on it. You can set reminders on it, such as uh, it, the electronic analogy of the yellow sticky tags and you can designate any kind of workflow objects that might be applicable to certain kind of objects. And you can say, you know, they're applicable to one kind of object, not applicable to another kind of object. It's all done through a simple configuration, which, which in itself is a spec XML file. Um, so, if, so, for example, um, this customer for multipurposing documents, they want to be able to multipurpose based on their various business groups, um, again, uh, various languages and, pro and project types. This says multi-select, so the project types you can select any paragraph, so, so, so you, you basically have multiple purposes in the specification, um, and you can keep one document, the master document, and designate stuff as applicable to design, build, build design, build, uh, procurement, and so on, and this is multi-select, so you can say this particular paragraph that's selected right now is uh, applicable to uh, these three project purposes, and further on, you can actually negate sounds a bit complicated, but actually negation is more applicable than positive. And really what that means is that you have a master document that contains a superset and you want to mark certain stuff as it does not belong to this context or it doesn't belong to this business group or it doesn't belong to, um, it, to uh, cold weather regions or uh, something like that. So, so basically this paragraph that we have selected, we can say specifically that it is applicable to design, bid, build. It is applicable to engineer, procure, construct, construct, but it is not applicable to consulting. And then um, you can see it kind of develops the expression. And uh, w once you tag a, a document with a bunch of these, you can then go into the um, You can then collapse the document and it will automatically renumber to uh, and can be exportable to just a certain purpose or just a certain, a certain application. Um, so for example, if I marked paragraph two as being not applicable to the current view, then whatever used to be paragraph three will automatically get renumbered to paragraph two and all that's very easy to do because the underlying XML model is very structured and very repeatable. Um, so a few other things. That <clears throat> I want to, want to show. Um, so here's an example, kind of from our own, um, our own, uh, what they call eat your own your own dog food. So we are a software company, and we need to document our software, and our help documentation is essentially a specification that specifies the software. And what we're actually able to do is I'm going to turn on the show purpose 
is we can actually go into various paragraphs. For example, we can go into the application the application menus, which are exactly these guys up here, and um, uh, also bring up context help. So we have uh, context help, and uh, hopefully that will help people reduce the learning curve and um, drive so and uh, learn the product more easily. So uh, whatever you do in the application, context help immediately uh, snaps along snaps alongside of it. Uh, you go into the, into the various application menus. But the way this is accomplished, actually, is we author the master help file in this environment. And for our multipurpose <coughs> tag, we have a product edition tag, which we, we can basically designate it between different product editions. And then we use this these tags on our software build server to actually generate the product editions with only the help that's applicable to those product editions, and it further goes on, on to either turn on or turn off certain application features, um, that, and is driven entirely just by simply writing the help file and dispositioning it for how it will later drive the software product. So, it, let's see, Leon. Yeah. I think we're maybe getting a little, a little uh, far afield from our audience's needs. Uh, could you? Select a, uh, a spec section and show us how, uh, on a practical level, it would be edited down to be project specific. You know, deleting uh, inapplicable paragraphs and adding uh, new information. Yeah, sure. So we'll uh, we'll uh, pick this. Uh... Let's try one of the uh, uh, try one of the uh, you know uh, product sections. Do you know the number? Off the top of your head? Oh, let's. Um, uh, oh, I know. Let's let's go to oh six one zero zero zero, which would be uh, rough carpentry. Oh six one oh zero. Well, or oh five. There you go. Up a, a few. Oh five five thousand. Let's try that. Five thousand. That's why. Yeah. There we go. That Metal fabrication. Yes. Okay, so um, we can go into uh, part one general uh, su summary related sections. Um. Well, say let's start with that now, under the uh, section that includes. Let's say that we don't have stair nosings, we don't have bollards, we section. don't have uh, number nine and number ten. So how we these guys, one point nine. Okay. One point. No, no, no. Go back to that, the summary paragraph, the summary the article. Summary. Yep. Okay. So under A, we have several items there that are, would not be applicable to this particular project. So let's say we want to delete uh, number four, number five. Okay. Uh, I'm, number um, eight. I'm actually going to have to do the example in a customer spec because these master guide libraries have not had the tags defined. Oh, sure. So, so okay. let's uh, pick, pick one in here because this, this, yeah. this has got all this. Yeah, anyway. Tags so, you know, pick, uh, we'll go cast and place concrete, for example. Okay. And do a, do a very similar thing. Uh, go to um, uh, products. Um, Products, uh, materials. Let's see what we have under materials: uh, cement, aggregates, uh, admixtures, and water. Well, let's say. Yeah, well, let's go to cement. The cause cement or okay. admixtures is fine. Okay, Any, so, let, so let's say let's say that uh, cement is not applicable. So we, we could basically. Multiply. Well, let's see under but un see under the Portland cement. Let's uh, the subparagraph. Um, uh, C and D. Maybe we don't need those. Okay. So you can you can click in C and D, and you, you can multi you can multi select the two of them all at, all at once, and then you can go into uh, project type, and you say that uh, these two that the tricalcium and non hydraulic. No, no. Right. I, is, uh, we're we're not talking about creating a master where we have tags that would automatically eliminate those. I'm saying that if those are, if this is, comes up, and I've got a specific project in mind, 
and I don't need those two paragraphs on this particular project at this particular time, how do I delete those two paragraphs? Do um, I just hit highlight them and hit delete? Um, you, you can highlight them and hit, del and hit delete. In a certain view, it would actually be marked as not applicable for that view. So for your application, you would simply define a tag that's called applicable to project or not applicable to project, and then you can tag anything like that and simply go into that view and turn, and turn it off. So if we, if we say that simply saying design, bid, build um, is your example of just sim simply saying yes or no, it's, app it's applicable to the project or not applicable to the project. Pretend, pretend these guys aren't here and this says uh, this, pro this project. So you select that and you say it's not applicable to this project and you hit OK. This is now marked as not applicable to this project, uh, but it's still there in, in, in your current document, whether it's a master or not. But then once if you go into this uh, this view and you want to go into um, this project, you will see that those will now simply disappear. Um, actually, are, they are shown as not applicable to the project because we are in the uh, show exclusions view. And so, you, so you can visually see, if you're, the, if you're the master, you can see what you mark. But as soon as you click show exclusions, you'll see they will disappear and E will become C. And now you're only going to have four items. And now you can print this document as such for this for this project or publish okay. it out or because the data is still obviously there you, you, you turn on show exclusions and boom it's right back again you could actually publish it out and have all that data stripped out so you can either keep it or not okay so that if at a later date right before the project's supposed to go out the door the uh, project professional says oh you know I really do need that uh, tricalcium aluminate content uh, paragraph, we could go back in and simply add it back in. Yeah, and not, on, not only that, but, not only that, but you can go into advanced search and you, and you can say, I've got, uh, on this project, I've got 80 documents, I've got them all loaded right now, and I want to, I want to find um, all paragraphs that are marked as not applicable to this kind of project just so you can double check it or change some of your dis, uh, some of your dispositions and it'll actually see you can basically search on any made that and here's those two paragraphs that I've just touched and predisposed as such but if you've got a whole lot of that all over a place this list will let you find it and sort okay. it and change it in any way that you want now Leon if if I click on one of those let's click on D and then can I add that back in? Yeah, you simply from go this, right here. This dialog box? Yeah, right here. It, it, it says uh, that currently this is uh, not in your project. You go in and you remove that tag. And uh, now you can see immediately in the document um, it is already that it's back, in. back in the project. Okay. Yeah. And you can open up multiple windows to the same file and everything uh, updates dynamically. Uh, Lewis, thank you for picking that up because I am experiencing some severe video delay here. So <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad you're jumping in. Yeah, I mean the, the reason I was showing our help file is just to show something that's not that's specific to us. A, now, you just show that uh, this stuff to be used in how in whatever way you want. Now, Leon, uh, one of our uh, listeners, uh, uh, Sheldon Wolf, asks. Um, if you delete this uh, this one paragraph, say the tricalcium aluminate content, and I don't even know what that is, um, if there are related paragraphs back in, say the installation portion of the specification, would that would they also be deleted? As long as you establish links. Um, so we would you would have to. But, but you'd have to establish links, links and rules um, so your integration, it, it may require a little bit of consulting, but stuff like that is very easy to do in this environment. So if, because another customer or another industry might not want such behavior, so we actually deploy these plugins that can be industry or customer specific, right. and we can easily define yours that, if, that we can actually set up links of a certain type. We, we can set up a link that's, that's uh, delete related, 
And once you delete anything along the lineage of those types of links, your plugin will define that the other objects will have to go as well. Um, that's obviously not implemented by default, but uh, with this environment and the underlying XML model, it makes itself very amendable to customizations and extensions like that. So there's, if there's anything that is voluminous or repetitive that you do frequently, uh, that can be set up. Okay, so if we had, a, so for example, a, a, an architectural woodwork section uh, that uh, might have multiple types of woodwork, but on a, a specific job we don't have, uh, for ex example, we, we don't have um, a style and rail wood wall paneling, uh, then if we set up our master so that the style and rail wall paneling product requirements and fabrication requirements were linked to the part three installation requirements and were also linked to the submittals requirements, then if we delete it in one place, it disappears in all three places. Correct. And the submittal requirements would ideally not be a standalone paragraph, but they would actually be submittal requirements as defined on each paragraph, so they would automatically go with that paragraph. Okay. And, and you can choose to do it either way. There's nothing that says that you can't have a section of submittal requirements or that you can't have an, a table at the bottom of the document that has your submittal requirements. You can slice and dice it however you want. All right. Well, I see we have, we're getting close to the end of our presentation. We have some uh, a couple of paragraphs here, um, uh, or a couple of questions, um, and uh, one is from Sharon Apple. Ask if can spec writers use Office master sections and other commercial masters in SpecWave. That is to say, uh, obviously you've imported spec text, but if uh, you are a subscriber to master spec, can you in import the master spec sections? and use it effectively in SpecWave? We can import anything from Microsoft Word right now. Um, cur currently at this 1.0 release, we need to set up the styling and, and paragraph numbering scheme so that the translation is 100%. And we have this technology that actually validates that the translation is 100%. 100% but we're currently working on a toolkit to allow customers and administrators to develop these conversion things, uh, these conversion schemes All right. on the fly um, for, the, then, for their organization. Uh, let's see. Um, we have a question from uh, Lynn about how does this compare to eSpecs? Are you familiar with the, the eSpecs product? I'm not. Okay. Well, we'll skip that question for another day. Uh, we have a, a question from Steve. Hey. Yes? Yes, that's the one I want you to read. <laughs> <laughs> from Steve Groth that says, when regular updates are received from the provider of the master, how do you incorporate those updated documents? Do you need to recreate all this wonderful metadata? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed, lost it there. All the metadata tags. And tags. Um, the answer is, is no. The, we have in the works a very advanced technology for doing that in a very robust way. I will give you a quick preview. Um, right, now, right now we're looking at design bid build. We have the ability to uh, compare that to anything. So we can compare it to the master document. And uh, this gives you a side-by-side -side colorized comparison. Um, well, well, Leon, I think... I think Steve's question is more along the lines that uh, if in the next iteration from spec text or from master spec, they add a couple of paragraphs and delete some other paragraphs, when we bring this into spec wave, will that handle those conversions automatically or do we have to recreate the metadata for the new paragraphs? I understand the question. That's why I wanted to okay. Oh, I'm sorry. That's why I wanted to quickly show this side-by-side -side colorized visualizer because what we're okay. working on is, is what we call item level granularity. We actually version, not at the document level, but we version at the, at the paragraph level. So we can tell exactly which paragraphs have changed. And, uh, but typically, you would not want to just accept a bulk change without reviewing it. So we can calculate because of the structured underlying XML and because of the revisions in each individual paragraph, we can bring up a colorized window like that that has exactly the changes 
that have occurred in the master document and allow you to quickly predispose which ones you want to accept, which ones you want, you, you want to reject. So there's going, there's going to be um, a very robust technology to make that seamless, but you also have the visualizer to be able to interfere. You could, if you, if, and especially if, your doc, if, um, if you have documents that haven't been touched from the published document, then you can just click the button and accept all the changes, and it works just like a virus checker. I mean, it, it, it just downloads and updates it without losing any tags, without losing any work. But if your local documents have already moved forward, there's maybe some things you do not want to just automatically overwrite and lose, and then you can bring up this colorized side-by-side -side comparison and decide what updates you want and what, what you don't want. On the where new text is added by the uh, the uh, supplier, uh, do we have to then create the uh, metadata for those paragraphs? Well, it depends on whether the supplier has already tagged them or not. Uh, we're currently talking to several such suppliers to publish the well, content well, in Specx. Yeah, so that's what I'm talking about. Of course, is uh, you know Arcom that publishes. Um, uh, uh, both uh, master spec and spec text now and uh, and of course other uh, publishers of master specification systems that's why I was saying in my presentation there's a lot of value for the publishers themselves to adopt this technology both for their in-house maintenance of the content that they publish and the ability to provide uh, more power more seamlessly to their users downstream so this okay. is something we are uh, pursuing and uh, we have uh, several organizations that are highly interested. well I see we're really at the end of our hour, and uh, uh, we really appreciate this introduction, uh, Leon. It's a, some challenging uh, stuff and some exciting uh, concepts about that, that might improve our workflow in the future. Um, Dave, you want to talk about next month's uh, session? Sure. Well, what I w wanted to do too is give Leon the opportunity. Uh, Leon, do you? What is the website? that our group oh, can yes. visit to see anything more? Um, www.teekspecs.com T-E-E-C-specs.com Okay. Well, great. Thanks so much for joining us today, Leon. I really and, uh, appreciate everybody, it. Uh, the product you have. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm actually hopeful for myself that this is something that could work well for us going out in the future. Uh, well, for next month, Lewis and I have been discussing and we'd like to present uh, talk uh, specification interviews. Uh, how do we get some of the information that specifiers need from our clients, from our design team, from anyone else that has the data that we're trying to collect to be able to actually get into the specification? And we think it'll be a, an interesting uh, discussion because there have also been recent discussions on the LinkedIn uh, CSI discussion forum uh, going along these same lines. There have been a lot of ideas presented. So we'd like to explore some of those. If any of you have ideas that you'd like to share ahead of time that you'd like us to consider for the presentation, please drop us a line by e to Lewis or me or to both and we'll try to get those ideas also incorporated. And David Anything and I were uh, had their list? yeah. David and I were a bit surprised by the uh, uh, warm uh, reception to our couple of sessions on tips and tricks for word processing, and so we thought about maybe if, uh, having a real brief, like five-minute segment of our meetings and just present one thing uh, each month. And so next month uh, I'm going to do a little something. But if you have a tip or trick that you would like to share with the audience, uh, we could have you as a guest presenter. Or if you want to, uh, if you would prefer, you can send the information to David or me, and one of us will present it for you. But again, as I said at the beginning of our meeting, this is we want this to be your program. And uh, if you've got some good ideas, we certainly want to hear them. Right. OK. So thank you very much for joining us today. appreciate that. And we'll be back again next month, uh, first Thursday, 3 o'clock Eastern. And yeah, we'll very early in the month. Us. I think it's the second. I think you're right. And we'll get the notice out with the uh, 
presentation topic so that you can all be aware of what it is. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.